I'm Brad Stone in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, pressure point. The Trump administration weighs limiting U.S. investors' portfolio, portfolio flows into China. And that includes possibly delisting Chinese companies like Alibaba and Baidu from U.S. stock exchanges. Plus, Micron stock tanks. Shares drop after earnings, a clear sign that semis can't shake U.S.-China trade tensions. And what a week, from Peloton's bumpy start to the public company to WeWork's roadshow, no show, and an executive shakeup. We'll review the week in tech. But first to our top story, the Trump administration is weighing a new weapon in the trade war with China. Bloomberg has learned officials are discussing ways to limit U.S. investors' portfolio flows into China, a move that could include delisting major Chinese companies like Alibaba from U.S. exchanges. Such a move could impact billions in the markets, and the Nasdaq, S&P 500, and Dow were all in the red following the report. Joining us to discuss in Los Angeles, Bloomberg's Sarah McGregor, who's been covering the trade war for us. Uh, Sarah, what is the goal of US, U.S. policymakers here? Are they trying to punish China or just protect U.S. investors? You know, it's hard to imagine with this trade war happening that, that a move like this isn't meant to be a bit provocative, isn't meant to push China into the corner and remind them of the leverage that the U.S. has. That being said, the sources that we spoke to said, you know, th this uh, capital, these talks of sort of the, the capital restrictions on China aren't part of the trade talks and they're really trying to keep them separate. I think, you know, if we look at the Marco Rubios of the world, the Florida senator, who, who have been trying to push for this kind of thing in the past, it's more of a moral or ethical argument. They're saying, you know, do we really want American investment funding a non-democratic government, funding the Communist Party, uh, fu you know, they, they allege, of course, some sort of human rights issues in China and, and other things. And I think they believe that they do not want to give money to this rising strategic and economic power to the U.S. So, Sarah, Alibaba obviously uh, listed on the New York Stock Ex Exchange, Baidu and JD.com on the Nasdaq. What does this mean for those companies? Well, as you said in the opening, Brad, that our reporting shows that one of the ideas, and again, this is very much in the ideas stage, you know, Trump has not approved it, it's being discussed, uh, which means, you know, it's, it, it, it's serious, but it, it's not going to be put into place tomorrow or anything, uh, you know, is, is a delisting of these Chinese companies. And I think, you know, some of the data shows that the, uh, there's about 156 Chinese companies on the three big ex biggest exchanges in the U.S., market cap of $1.2 trillion. You know, this isn't... Um, small change that we're talking about. And I think for some of these companies, it's been, you know, a huge win for them to get into the U.S. market. They see, you know, a rules-based sort of approach here and ways for these Chinese companies to expand themselves. And so it obviously would be a pretty big move for, for these companies and be, um, you know, wouldn't be taken lightly. Sarah, tell us a little bit about Peter Navarro, the primary White House trade advisor, and according to our story, one of the primary forces behind this, uh, behind this thinking. So all along in the trade war, the, the palace intrigue, who has Trump's ear, the, the hawks or the more market-oriented advisors and administration, there's always a lot of speculation. And with a proposal like this, it's very clear that advocates like Peter Navarro and even uh, outside advisors like Steve Bannon, you know, are, are behind it. They are some of the key advocates. They are very hawkish on China. And, and as, as I was saying earlier, they really see... Um, you know, a decoupling of the U.S. and China, whether it's financial markets or otherwise, as the key to sort of uh, uh, punishing China, cutting them off. They see China as a bad actor in the world and as this very big threat technologically, economically to the U.S. And so something this extreme is, um, you know, wouldn't be surprising that someone like Peter Navarro would be an advocate of. What strikes me as so odd here, Sarah, is that we've heard now for many months that one of the primary goals of the trade dispute has been to open up Chinese markets, to allow more access to those markets and to Chinese companies. So wouldn't this move be contrary to that goal? Absolutely. You know, these tariffs are predicated on the fact that the U.S. wants to negotiate a trade deal that will give U.S. companies greater access to China's market, of course, increased transparency as well, but at the same time, make sure that there's a level playing field for American companies to be able to compete better. 
But then we see these moves that are really at odds, like this proposal on the capital restraints. You know, the, the tariffs themselves restrict trade. We see sanctions uh, against companies like Huawei that cut off U.S. suppliers. Um, you know, currency manipulation, labeling China a currency manipulator. So really some of the actions seem at odds and, you know, could make, um, you know, make you believe perhaps that the Trump administration really is using some of this leverage in, in ways that run against what it says its stated trade policy is, which is to really make everything better for U.S. companies, a more global level playing field. And, and so it sort of, I think it leaves a lot of people in a, in a bit of a confusion about what really is the goal of the Trump administration. So last question, I'll make it a quick one, Sarah. Let me ask you to prognosticate. On the one hand, we could have a trade, a resolution of this trade war. And on the other, other hand, which you raised, the prospect of a full out decoupling from the Chinese economy. Which way do you think we're heading right now? Wow, that's, that's the million dollar question, but I do think we have some trade talks coming up in the next couple of weeks. You know, at this point, it would be small wins. If they, you know, the two sides came out of the meeting say, saying, you know, China's agreed to some agriculture purchases and the U.S. maybe to, to really move forward on granting these Huawei licenses as promised, for instance, you know, that would, I think, just diffuse the situation even a little bit. So. At this point, you know, worst case scenario, we see these capital restraints, for instance. So, you know, there's there's sort of multiple ways this trade war can go. And I think that's why it's so important when we look ahead to these uh, tentatively scheduled October 10th to 11th trade meetings between the U.S. top officials. We can really get a sense, OK, where is where is this headed now? What's the latest direction? OK, Bloomberg, Sarah McGregor in Los Angeles. Thank you for joining. While the U.S. and China remain far apart when it comes to trade, the U.S. and Japan sealed a deal this week. This week's agreement between Tokyo and Washington ensures tariff-free cross-border data transfers. That includes videos and video games, e-books and software. So what does that mean for the U.S. tech industry? Earlier today, I asked Martin Schroeder, senior vice president of IBM Global Markets. Well, it's a really important, really important agreement because digital trade as a component of the economy is actually growing much, much faster uh, than the rest of the economy. So it is the sort of the growth of jobs, which are now digital uh, focused jobs. So it's really important for the entire digital economy. But what's really important within this agreement, this now sets the gold standard for what we think these digital trade agreements should really look like. It has the components, the elements that we've been strong proponents for. Now, it is part of a larger agreement that includes some reduction of, of tariffs on farm goods. Uh, and there are parties out there, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, that says it does not go far enough. And they actually raise the specter of, of uh, intellectual property protections and says they need to go stronger. Do you feel this does go as far as it needs to go? Oh, believe me, this is absolutely, as I said, the gold standard in digital trade. So let me walk through just a few of the pieces here that are so important, I think, to the entire international community and the, and, and the things that the international community can now look to uh, as they think about how they enter into these kinds of agreements. So first, there is free data flow. Obviously, there's, there's privacy and security, but there is free flow of data across all industries. In an instance where data needs to be you know, kept, uh, kept for security reasons, obviously that'll get covered, but, but by and large, data across all industries can move freely. Very important. Secondly, it doesn't have uh, any data localization mandates. So not Neither of the two governments are going to force a company or force uh, any participants to store their data in a particular place. It's very unproductive and it doesn't really achieve uh, what, they're, what they're trying to achieve. And then thirdly, to your question on uh, intellectual property, this, this agreement actually does two things that make it the gold standard. One, uh, it protects your source code. So neither country will force you to give up your source code. We obviously have never given up our source code. We never would. But it goes another step as well. It also protects the algorithms that you use in your software. And when you think about both the source code and then the algorithms, that really is sort of the critical design elements of, of the next century of the, of the software-driven economy. So Martin, what does it mean practically for a company like IBM, which has a sizable business in Japan? 
Well, look, it, it obviously gives us now a framework by which we can be very confident as we build our business in Japan and in the U.S. that, th that these two economies are going to operate in a digital way that we think is the right way to do it. More importantly now, as we're out talking about, uh, about digital trade with all, with all the other places we do business, it's really clear now we can point to the gold, again, the gold standard. The, the gold standard, this standard exists as well in, in the USMCA agreement. So we've been very active uh, promoting USMCA from a digital trade perspective. So now we've got two really good examples. The challenge now is we have to get many, many more countries to adopt these kinds of digital trade standards. And we're very far from any kind of trade agreement with one of those countries, China. Uh, but, but perhaps we can dream, what would a digital trade agreement with China look like, Martin? Well, I think, again, it really importantly, and, and I'll do them sort of in reverse order here, because I think there are uh, elements of this that are going to be really important in that specific discussion. And that is all about protecting intellectual property and protecting algorithms. So any digital trade agreement, again, between any countries, but, but certainly China as well, needs to protect uh, and needs Needs to protect source code needs to protect algorithms. There is uh, obviously an element of this that says, you know, we, we can't make anybody store their data in a particular place. What we've said before is data localization mandates should should be uh, should be removed from these. So that would be a big component of something uh, that we would want to see. And then again, just the idea that data can flow freely again, subject to national security concerns and privacy concerns, but data can flow freely. That's the way the, the world supply chains work. That's the way the banking systems work. And any country that wants to be integrated into those global supply chains or global banking systems really does need to recognize those three principles because I, I do think that's how the rest of the world is gonna be thinking about digital trade. Martin, quick last question. What does this agreement mean for the U.S. technology consumer? Well, this is, a, again, a big help. When you think about the, the digitization of the world, every discussion we're, we have going on with our clients, and yes, we're an enterprise-focused business, but our enterprise clients are serving consumers. So this allows our enterprise clients to now digitize their processes, to digitize their offerings, and reach consumers in whole new ways. We've seen a lot of innovation coming out of technology. That innovation now, with this agreement between U.S. and Japan, can continue, and importantly, as I said, now we have have to make it much, much more widespread. That was Martin Schroeder, Senior Vice President of IBM Global Markets. Coming up, Micron's very bad day. The chip maker slumps the most in a year, and the rest of the industry follows suit. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Micron is having its worst day in a year on Friday. Shares of the chipmaker tumbled nearly 10% at one point in trading. This on the heels of Micron giving a forecast for both earnings and gross margins that was below expectations on Thursday. But some analysts say the worst may, be not, may not be over for the company. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Ian King to discuss. Ian, uh, Micron based in Boise, Idaho, 40-year-old company, but in some ways I think of it really as a bedrock of the Silicon Valley and tech ecosystems. So what did they possibly say yeah. uh, in this earnings report to instigate such a sell-off? Yeah, I mean, you obviously you pointed to the numbers. Not really that scary, not sort of 11% percent down scary. Really what was happening was the commentary that was going on in, in their prepared remarks, and that was, you know, they were pressing all of the, the red panic buttons for, you know, chip investors, which is, we're still concerned about Huawei, we don't know when we're going to get licenses there. There's been some, you know, upticks in China, but guess what, that might be more inventory build, you know, not really related to end demand. And inventory is, is you know, absolutely the worst thing you can possibly say in the memory chip business. So what I'm hearing is this may not be a micron problem, this could be a problem for the semi conductor industry and tech overall as kind of the trade war hangs over everything right now. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, all of the stocks have run up on the expectation that the trade war goes away, that everything is fine. Memory chip market is a very volatile market. It's also, you know, Micron is one of those companies that says, look, you're hurting us. They can go and buy stuff from wherever they want. They can go buy it from Samsung, from SK Hynix, from wherever they want. Why are you hurting us? They're kind of the, the, the you know, the most representative of this kind of conundrum that a lot of tech companies are facing. Now, most people probably haven't heard of Micron, and yet yeah. recently the President of the United States went to the UN General Assembly and actually talked about Micron and a current dispute with China. Let's listen to the President. A company owned by the Chinese state allegedly stole Micron's designs, valued at up to $8.7 billion. 
Soon, the Chinese company obtains patents for nearly an identical product, and Micron was banned from selling its own goods in China. Ian, what's the president talking about here? Um, well, some of those references I'm not 100 percent sure square with our understanding of what's going on. But really, there, there was a case here, and, and it's an ongoing case that started with an investigation in Taiwan prosecutions there, whereby a Taiwanese company was allegedly facilitating the theft of Micron's designs, its IP, to take them to China, which, as you know, is trying to build its own memory chip business. That's an ongoing situation, and it's something that the, you know, the DOJ has looked at here and sort of lauded the Taiwanese for, for trying to do something about. Now, there's an entirely separate trade standoff between South Korea and Japan. Yeah. Uh, I had presumed that that would help Micron's uh, prospects because you would assume that Samsung then would have limited access to the Japanese market, but that does not appear to be the case here. Right, yeah. The, the argument was that you know the Japanese and the Koreans are, are angry with each other. The Japanese have threatened to basically cut off a supply of crucial chemicals needed to make memory chips. Samsung is the biggest maker of them in South Korea. Wouldn't that be good for Micron because, you know, where else are you going to go and get chips? Um, and it turns out the answer is that the Chinese, which is the biggest market for these things, have gone ahead and bought a load of these things in advance to forestall any possible sort of benefit, any switch in market share. So that wasn't taken too well either when they sort of talked about that. Ian, last question. Is there a chance we're going to look at this week and what's happened to Micron as a sort of canary in the coal mine for the semiconductor industry or tech in general? I mean, that's absolutely the concern. When you look at the, the money that has come into this stock and, and chips in general, and chip, chip stocks in general, all on the expectation that things are going to get better in the second half of the year. Really what they're saying is hard to see that right now. Okay, we'll see what happens. Bloomberg's Ian King, thank you very much. Coming up, unprofitable companies are raising the most IPO cash since the dot-com era. What's going on with the so-called unicorns and the rush to risk? That's next. This is Bloomberg. Now to a story we're following, the continuing black eye for the IPO market. On Friday, shares of Peloton Interactive fell for the second straight day of trading. The exercise bike startup has dropped by double digits since it went public this week. And Peloton's poor debut is only adding to a year of lackluster ones that have included names like Uber, Lyft, and of course WeWork, which shelved its IPO until next year. Joining me to discuss is Santosh Rao in New York. He's a partner and head of research at Manhattan Venture Partners. Santosh, I'm really glad to have you here glad to, to be explain here. Uh, explain what's going on in the markets. It was supposed to be, it has been a banner year for exits for tech companies, and yet it's gotten really ugly lately. What's happening? Is this just one of those imperceptible shifts in market psychology? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think that's a very extreme word. I think what we are seeing is uh, a moment of recognition. Um, I think the private markets, the bankers, and the public markets have to come to terms with uh, how the private shares are valued. Uh, I think overall, it's been great. Uh, we have $50 billion raised so far in the IPO market. Exits are important for the whole capital markets process, the IPO process. So I think everything's fine. WeWork was an outlier. Uh, Peloton, okay, it's getting hit because of WeWork and all the other issues right now. There's some socio or macro events also going on. But overall, I think the IPO process is alive. The robust, the pipeline is robust. Everything's going great. It just needs to, we need to tweak the model. Uh, yeah, the valuation is what's broken at this point. But overall, I think the IPO process is still alive and doing very well. Okay, so what I hear you saying is that the public markets have really been kind of unable to accommodate the valuation set by these very hyperbolic private markets over the last decade. So then what's the role of the investment banks? What should the Morgan Stanley, Stanleys and Goldman Sachs be doing as they kind of usher these companies, you know, down, down the runway and recently to, to kind of disastrous IPO offerings? Yeah, so and I, I follow this market very closely we, all day long. You know, we look at a number of private companies. I think what's going to happen is I can understand in the early stages, you need the proof of concept, you need the revenue. So it goes, uh, the valuations uh, reflect that, you know, the, uh, the rise in 
revenues, the increase in revenues. But as you get to the later rounds, I think the investors have to keep in mind that as you get closer to the public markets, it's not going to be just revenue. It's not going to be just growth at any cost. You have to keep an eye. You have to discount the fact that profitability is or is not in picture. So you need to factor that in. So I think expectations have to be managed. I think bankers need to play a big role telling them that this is what the value is. This is what the public markets are expecting. And so to, to make the whole thing, I think bankers will play a very big role in kind of getting this thing over. It's important that they play a big role in this. IPOs are important, like I said, and uh, majority of them are doing well. Okay, they pull back, that's fine. Even Facebook pull back, number of others pull back, but ultimately they grow into the valuation. You have to give them some room. And, uh, and finally, I want to add, how do you value uh, a transformational company? That's not easy. I mean, uh, Lyft and Uber are transformational companies. So there's so many others. This, these are excellent companies. By definition, they are disruptive. No one knows. There is no comp for them. So price discovery is going to be tough. So you need to come to terms with that, need to understand. Let them grow. Let them. Be, we need them. Well, Santosh, so, so WeWork has shelved its IPO. Endeavor postponed it. There's still, though, 100, over 100 uh, startups that have filed to go public that are on the runway, including some of yours at Manhattan Ventures. Um, you know, how do you, how do you advise them? What, what, you know, is the IPO door still open right now? It's, it's wide open. Uh, I think you'll see them come to market. Uh, the, the valuations are going to be more rational. I think that's the biggest thing. I think everything's going to be more rational, and that's good. The irrational exuberance probably hit its <laughs> limits, uh, you can say towards the end, last few uh, IPOs, it needs to come down, let it be more rational, let, the, let there be a path to profitability. Even if you're not there, explain it very well. Get there, and that's what we do. Uh, we, when we invest in these companies, we look for that. Uh, unless we have that, we, are, we, 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 we tell our investors that you gotta be careful. So all that is factored in, that's the right way to invest. Don't just throw money at any IPO. Look at it, look at the corporate governance structure, look at everything, and then uh, enter the market. Santosh, uh, two of your companies at Manhattan Venture Partners went public this year, Lyft and Pinterest. Both are under their IPO prices and as a result kind of laboring under a little bit of a dark cloud. You know, what do those companies need to do in this market environment, you know, to change the perception that they went public at a, at a difficult time? No, uh, we are very happy with both the investments. In fact, Pinterest is above the IPO price, uh, if I'm not mistaken. They're doing very well. Uh, Lyft, I think, uh, it's getting tethered to Uber and Uber's problems. Uh, Lyft is a very good investment. It's a very good uh, entry point at this point. But uh, we look at Lyft on a long-term basis. We are long-term investors. Uh, we are definitely not one quarter, two quarter. We did not expect it to just kind of take off. Uh, we are there. Uh, we want to see it. There's a huge market. On demand transportation, transportation as a service is going to be huge. And Lyft in particular, and that's why we invested in Lyft, it's a pure play focused in, on, in North America where the economics, unit economics are the best. So they have a path to profitability. They already said that 2019 is their peak investment year. And they have a path to profitability. And they said uh, competition and pricing is getting more rational. So what do you need? I think these guys, the last two quarters were very good. Right off the gate, they're good. So we are very happy okay. with Lyft. And we think Pinterest is also a very good story. Great. And they'll continue to do well. Okay, Santosh Rao of Manhattan Venture Partners, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, a handful of tech CEOs stepped down. From WeWork's Adam Newman to eBay's Devin Wenick and Jules Kevin Burns. More on a dizzying week in tech. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Brad Stone in San Francisco. A tech trend this week was the C-suite revolving door. Three notable CEOs stepped down in the midst of controversies. Adam Newman of WeWork, Devin Wenig of eBay, and Kevin Burns of Juul all are being replaced as their companies try to right their ships. To discuss, I'd like to bring in Andrew Challenger, vice president at outplacement firm Challenger J and Christmas. He's joining us from Phoenix, Arizona. Andrew, thanks for joining. Why is it such a volatile time here for CEOs of American companies? Yeah, it's really not even just a the tech sector where we're seeing this volatility. Uh, we recorded 159 CEO departures in August. That's the highest single month of CEO departures uh, that we've tracked uh, over the first eight months of the year. We've tracked 1,009 CEO departures. That's the largest number we've seen over any eight-month period since we started tracking in 2002. So that includes 
2008 during the recession. Um, it's a time where it's tough to hold on to the top role at the helm of a company, as we're seeing quite a few departures. That's remarkable. So, so what is going on? Why, why the uh, the turnover? Yeah, it's uh, not. There's no simple answer. Uh, part of it is certainly the predicted economic slowdown, growth around the world. Uh, it's getting uh, some people. You know, boards are a little jumpy. Uh, they're they're making some changes. Uh, we're seeing some CEOs stepping down by choice at a time when the company's doing really well financially and they can go out on their own terms and you know, put into uh, place their succession plans. Uh, and then we're also seeing a, a, a lot of tech companies. Uh, it, it's the area where we saw the second most number of, of CEO departures. Uh, a lot of that, you know, we're in a 10-year bull market run right now. Tech companies that uh, started off have had founders move up with them for a long period of time. Uh, those, some of those companies are moving into a more mature phase of, uh, of their organization. And uh, corporate boards are finding that these uh, younger, often founder CEOs are not able and don't have the skill sets to, to navigate the company in this next period of, of their lives. Yeah, well, well, let's talk about who's replacing those founder CEOs. Uh, some interesting choices. I'm curious if you see any trends in the interim or replacement CEOs at companies like WeWork and Jewel. Clearly, they're, they're searching for a contrast, the boards are, uh, to the kind of visionary, charismatic, maybe slightly unpredictable founder CEO. Yeah, I think you saw a great example of that at, at Jewel, where they moved uh, to, to an, a new uh, CEO that is a, a longtime executive in the tobacco industry, right? It's such a clear example of a founder uh, that broke through regulatory paradigms, uh, made something out of nothing, uh, but has now run into uh, the next phase of the company's life cycle where they're dealing and navigating with a very complicated, uh, bureaucratic, slow-moving regulatory environment. And so I think they made a really smart move by bringing in uh, an executive from the tobacco industry that has uh, a lot of experience there. Andrew, real quickly, let's talk about eBay. So Scott Schenkel, the CFO, now replacing Devin Wenig as, as CEO. Does the fact that the CFO has taken over now signal that some financial engineering is in eBay's future? Well, uh, you know, the, the, the entire push to, to have uh, Wenig removed uh, was, was uh, 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 really propelled by activist shareholders in the company. Uh, so they have a, a clear sight on the bottom line looking at the numbers. I think they're probably pretty happy with, with the naming of uh, the CFO of the organization, somebody that's going to be uh, thinking about cutting costs. But they're, they're also going to be uh, looking for one of their main complaints uh, was that even though there had been growth at eBay, uh, the growth wasn't seismic enough. It wasn't uh, you know, large enough in this environment where you'd think a company like eBay would be doing uh, fairly well. Uh, so, so there, are, I think they'll also, uh, you know, continue to search and, and and maybe look for another transformational type of CEO. Okay, Andrew Challenger of Challenger J Gray and Christmas. Thank you for joining us. The week also centered on the IPO craze of 2019, but as we're noticing, planned offerings have been close to disastrous. Endeavor has yanked its planned offering for the second time this year. Bloomberg learned that part of the reason Endeavor got cold feet is the poor performance of Peloton in its first day of trading. Investors soured on the startup known for its exercise bikes that allowed users to join along in virtual spin classes from home. Peloton shares have tumbled more than 12% below its IPO price of $29. To discuss this and other top tech stories of the week, we're joined by Wedbush analyst Michael Pachter. Also with us, Bloomberg Businessweek's Max Chafkin. Uh, Michael, let's start with you. It's a, it's a tough week to do a week in review because so much has happened. But let's start quickly with WeWork. Do you, do you see any path forward for WeWork after the week that it's had? You know, I, I think that they just mischaracterize themselves as a tech company. And SoftBank reinforced that by making big investments. And you know, I think investors figured out this is a real estate company. And so you know, every time you see them compared, you see them compared to other real estate companies. And the multiples are just much, much, much lower. And there really isn't a lot of tolerance for losing money in that business. I mean, they, they have 15-year leases, and then they turn around and carve that up 
and you know rented out piecemeal to individuals and small businesses it that there's no tech involved there so you know i think that that's starting to weigh on all the other companies. It's actually weighing on Netflix. I mean, they're, they are a tech company, but you're seeing their valuation drop. Peloton arguably is a tech company. I mean, they're delivering you know, health services, they're delivering workout services into the home. It's pretty smart, but the valuations are coming down because investors just aren't buying it anymore. Max, uh, lots of companies, Airbnb and Postmates among them, are, are still looking at the IPO market and wondering if they can get out the door. You know, if, 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 if you're in their shoes looking at what's happened to Peloton and Endeavor and, of course, WeWork, you know, what lessons do you take from it? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure they're worried. I think we saw Airbnb, you know, come out publicly saying, you know, we're, we, we are going to go public next year. And, and I assume that was kind of a response to, to watching, uh, can, you know, WeWork have all this trouble. They want to communicate to, to their employees and investors that they are still committed to um, getting them some liquidity. I mean, I, I think, as, as Michael says, there, there's this thing where a lot of companies that weren't really tech companies were selling this vision of kind of network effects. And, and, and in WeWork's case, it was, we're not just a sublet, we're going to be a, a hub for where you live and where you educate your children and, and they're going to be members who don't actually rent the space here are going to pay us for some reason. And it was kind of a, a lot of magical thinking that, that depended on, on this one guy. Now, now the, the, the thing about WeWork is that as a business, there, there is something solid about, about subletting. Uh, it's more of a problem for SoftBank, arguably, than it is for, for WeWork. I think WeWork can have a real business. The, the question is, how does SoftBank deal with what could be be a huge write down. Well, Michael, let me ask you about that. Do you expect SoftBank and the broader private markets that have bid up these valuations to be humbled at all by recent events? You know, I, I think this is like that tulip bubble where, you know, I read this brilliant book called The Upstarts by Brad Stone, mm -hmm. and it talked about the sharing economy, and that made sense to me. If, if, if a company through technology can get individuals to share their assets and give their time, then there's a lot of profit to be made. And I think in that frenzy, we started classifying companies like WeWork and Peloton as tech companies. So, so no, SoftBank overstepped. They, they made a mistake. They, as Max said, they're gonna have to take a write down. Clearly, this thing is not gonna recover that kind of valuation. Max, let's talk about Facebook. The DOJ now investigating Facebook in addition to the FTC. I guess at this point, if you, if you live in Washington and you're not investigating Facebook, you have to ask yourself what you're doing there. Yeah. Uh, but we recently reported that Sheryl Sandberg is going to Washington uh, next month. So what, you know, what, what does this mean for Facebook and how do they steer out of it? Yeah, I mean, don't forget, you have Congress, you also have uh, uh, state attorneys general, and you also have, you know, crucially, the European Union. So, so there are, you know, there are many, many government entities that are that are looking at Facebook closely. I mean, I think we when we saw Mark Zuckerberg testify in Congress, uh, you know, in the wake of the Cambridge Analytica thing, he, he repeatedly brought up the, the idea that Facebook is an American social network and is in competition with China, with these Chinese social networks, particularly TikTok, uh, the, the ByteDance-owned social network, which has been growing really fast. So I wouldn't be surprised if you see the message from Facebook coming out that you don't want to break us up because because our competition is outside the U.S., uh, you would be you would be damaging an American technology company, and you don't want to do that. Uh, Michael, Amazon uh, had a hardware announcement. It's annual fall hardware announcement. We've talked a lot about Amazon over the years. Um, new Echoes, uh, a, a ring where you can talk to Alexa, um, ear, earbuds. They announced. Was there anything in the in that hardware announcement and the strategy that surprised you? Yeah, the, the glasses are easily the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and, you know, I, I saw the funniest line on Twitter, I hope I could say this, you know, buy the glasses and Alexa sits on your face. I mean, that's just the dumbest thing I've ever seen. So uh, they, I think Amazon is grasping at straws on its hardware strategy. I understand an in-home, you know, help device. So, so I understand the Echo devices. And I guess to some extent, I, I understand the integration with Ring because it gets you to kind of have your whole home, you know, Amazonized. I just think some of these other things are a solution in search of a problem. We need another set of earbuds like we need a hole in the head. It just seems like a really stupid move by them. I presume that you're not wearing the eyeglasses now. Uh, Max, no, these are, these um, are real glasses. 
I, I Max, feel like I have no. to defend Amazon here. Uh, just, just yeah, go for it. Uh, go for you it. Know, if only for intellectual uh, curiosity. I mean, I think the argument here for what Amazon is doing is number one, they're kind of known for releasing uh, crazy products. They do this sort of thing all the time, and arguably they don't have the same brand that Apple does. No one blames them when they when they they put a dud out there, and and they even even in the branding of these products, you know, they're calling it like the day one edition or something like that. It's in, invitation only. They're not presenting this as a consumer product. The other thing is, you know, the, the whole bet with Alexa is you get it everywhere, and, and and they want people to use this thing to do other things besides listen to music. So I'm sure, you know, they realize that that it's pretty weird to put a smart speaker on a pair of eyeglasses, um, but, you know, maybe somebody uses it, and, and maybe it's more about kind of communicating uh, the value of Alexa to the world. I mean, that's my best attempt at what this thing is for. Okay, thank you for that, Max. We'll, we'll count on seeing you wearing a pair of those glasses next time. Uh, we got to leave it there. Wedbush, Wedbush analyst Michael Pachter and Bloomberg Business Week's Max Chafkin, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, regulation reality. We look at why LibraCoin has not been as quick out of the gate as hoped. This is Bloomberg. It's been a rough week for cryptocurrencies, with the likes of Bitcoin tumbling more than 20% over the past week. Some have attributed the decline to Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg hinting that the launch of its Libra coin may be delayed. Earlier, Bloomberg's Guy Johnson and Bonnie Quinn spoke exclusively to Bertrand Perez, the Libra Association COO, about the challenges they're facing in bringing Libra to market. We are engaged with a, a, a discussion, a proactive discussion with the regulators on both sides of the Atlantic. And, and those discussions are very important. And again, that's the reason why we have taken so much uh, time uh, early before launching anything, because we knew that we would ha be uh, having questions coming from regulators uh, from different parts of the world. So right now, our discussions with regulators is for us to prove them that we are, provide, we are going to uh, provide proper uh, solutions and, and proper answers to their questions and concerns well, when it turns out to AML and, and, and counter financing of terrorism. So the launch date obviously will be uh, depending on, the, on how those discussions go and, and, and how quick we get uh, approval from, the, from the, the respective regulators. Okay, let me try and pin you down on this one then. The, the pushback from regulators has been fairly fierce. Do you think you are going to be able to launch in the first half of 2020, yes or no? For, for now, we, we are still discussing with the regulators. So uh, again, what I want this to be clear is that, as, as we've said, we will not launch a, a platform that is not compliant with the regulations uh, across the world. So as, as, as far as we don't get those uh, proper uh, uh, regulate, regulatory uh, approvals, we are going to continue working and then, as, as said, we will not launch anything uh, before that. So how is your application for a FINMA license going? That's the Swiss regulator who, of course, has to be on board here as well as Europe and the US. Yes, so a few weeks ago, the FINMA has, uh, has decided that uh, we, should be, uh, we should be regulated as a payment system. Uh, so this was, uh, this was the, the, the announcement that was made by FINMA a few weeks ago. And right now, we're in the process of submitting, of applying for that li license uh, to the FINMA. So over the course of the next few, few months, so ideally before the end of this year, we would be applying uh, to the FINMA, and then FINMA will be reviewing our uh, our uh, application and we'll, uh, we'll uh, decide upon the, the license for uh, this payment system uh, network. Talk to us about hiring. What does it look like right now? How many do you have in Geneva? How many are you hoping to hire soon and will they be technical or will the technical staff be more in Silicon Valley? So, so uh, Geneva is the headquarter of the Libra Association so right now we are a little shy of 10 people and the idea is that we are going to start uh, staffing in, in different areas whether it's compliance, whether it's uh, finance operations, whether it's tech operations and also we'll have some engineering, engineering uh, uh, people here in, in Geneva uh, in addition to the, the resources that we have in the Silicon Valley. Mr. Perez, are you advanced in hiring, in your regulatory approach as you would like to be? Did you expect to be where you are now or did you expect to be further forward in all of this? 
Well, uh, uh, everyone would be uh, would prefer to be uh, more advanced, but the, all the all the discussions we're having with the regulators and the questions they are they are asking, uh, and and the fact that we want to build uh, a long-term platform that is sustainable and that is compliant, uh, I think it's it's worth having those discussions and and going through the details with the regulators, even if that's consuming some time. It's worth it because again, we are here to build a, a long-lasting platform that is there for the long term. That that will bring a lot of benefits for the customers, but we don't want to do that in competition for uh, against uh, compliance. So that's key to uh, to our uh, platform, and and we better have those discussions again in advance. Uh, and that's why we decided to announce that project so early stage, so we can clear that and make sure that we have provided the proper answers to the questions. Uh, and then we can, uh, once all that is clear, we can move on with the uh, execution phase. That was Libra Association COO Bertrand Perez. Still ahead, hospitality startup Sonder digs into the hotel market to keep up with Airbnb. We'll have the details. This is Bloomberg. Apple is taking on Hollywood. Dow Jones is reporting that the company will bring feature-length films to theaters before re releasing them on their streaming service. Apple hopes the move will attract big-name directors and producers, and by releasing features in theaters first, Apple reportedly hopes to avoid the tensions that have bubbled up between theater chains and another Hollywood player, Netflix. In the past year, hotel chains and home-sharing sites have started encroaching on each other's turf. Airbnb advertises hotel rooms on its platform, and Marriott recently launched a homestay offering. The latest player to blur the lines is short-term rental startup Sonder. The San Francisco-based hospitality company is expanding beyond its network of custom-designed vacation apartments, signing leases with 17 off-the-beaten-path mom-and-pop-style hotels in New York, London, Dublin, and other cities in recent months. So is Sonder a rival to Airbnb or a partner? To discuss, we're joined by Bloomberg Technologies' Olivia Carville. Olivia, I guess I'm unfashionable because before your story, I did not, I have not ever heard of Sonder. Tell us a little bit about it and how it fits into the, into the very fast-growing short-term rental market. Yeah, they are a relatively unknown company at the moment. The interesting thing about Sonder is they're trying to target that sweet spot between a home and a hotel. So they want to have that funky vibe of an Airbnb with cool furniture in a hip neighborhood, but also with the convenience of a hotel. So they offer 24-7 um, mobile concierge service or professional cleaners that can come in, trying to target the business consumers or the business travelers, as well as those who may not want to stay in the central business district in a massive hotel but kind of want the convenience of one at the same time. Olivia, you're right that Sonder is a partner to Airbnb, but it sounds like it almost could be a competitor. Why is Airbnb not threatened by this substart? I feel like Airbnb might be threatened by Sonder one day, but it's important to remember that Sonder is relatively small right now. They only have about 10,000 listings globally, and they're also using Airbnb as a platform to advertise their listings. So they really view Airbnb as a partner because they need Airbnb to connect to their potential consumers. So from Airbnb's perspective, Sonder is actually um, like another listing on their website rather than a rival necessarily. But it's also important to remember that Airbnb is moving more and more into that boutique hotel space. So as we get further along the line and Sonder continues growing, maybe one day they will be deemed a rival. Or, or could they be an acquisition target? Of course, you know, Airbnb, as you say, wants to expand its hotel listings. Some of the big hotel chains are, are going to think twice about partnering with a potential juggernaut like Airbnb. Could Airbnb turn to a Sonder for, say, an acquisition? Definitely possible. We know that Airbnb has invested in Lyric, which is a direct competitor of Sonder, and that happened earlier this year. And we also saw Airbnb um, go after the Hotel Tonight acquisition earlier this year. That was a $400 million acquisition, their biggest to date so far. So Airbnb is definitely actively looking in this space, and it's likely they've either been talking to Sonder or will be doing so. So one of the things that has slowed down uh, the short-term rental market, as you've reported, is the regulatory hurdles, particularly in cities like New York. Uh, does Asander face any of those challenges? 
Well, one thing that is distinctive for Sonda beyond the typical Airbnb or Expedia's VRBO is that they are legally compliant in all 21 cities that they operate in. So they're more interested in going after the hotel licenses in order to legally provide accommodation rather than necessarily disrupting the market and trying to take on municipalities over those regulatory issues. So that's not a headache for this particular company. Okay, so if it's not a regulatory hurdle, what could slow Sonder down? Well, I talked to a bunch of skeptics who were saying that one of the biggest issues for Sonda is actually its business model. So we've heard that they have been signing on with leases with about 60 different um, small to medium sized hotels. And typically they're signing five year leases with these hotels and then they're going to revamp the property and rent them out on a short term basis to guests coming through. And this long term rental, long -term rental deal for like short term arrangements is very similar to a WeWork model. So people have been asking questions about how much debt is Sonda going to take on before they actually start turning a profit. So a few people have been asking questions about that and we'll be looking at the company closely in coming years as they continue to sign these leases. Last question, Olivia, and I'll make it a quick one. Are, are venture capitalists as excited about Sonder as they were about Airbnb now over a decade ago? It doesn't appear so at this stage, but they were actually, they are one of, um, sorry, they had a, a funding round back in July. It was a $225 million round, so that actually vaulted them into the unicorn category. So in that degree, yes, they are. But I think you're right in what you were saying earlier, that they're not very well known at this stage, which is surprising given that they do have a billion dollar valuation. Okay, Bloomberg's Olivia Carville, thanks for joining. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Reminder, we are live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at TikTok on Twitter. This is Bloomberg.